Hello, Dr. Ron England here, coming to you from Data Hunter State College, and I'm going to talk a little bit about data frames because you're going to be using them a lot uh, if you're in EGN 3214, my programming for engineers class, which uses Python. Data frames were kind of a very useful thing to be able to use. So I threw up. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to actually just do this by example. Uh, I'm looking at open you uh, some some open textbooks, and in this um, web page that I'm going to be pulling in as a data frame, there's a bunch of tables. See table, 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 table. So there's a bunch of tables. So uh, that kind of gets that so that you can see what we're going to be working with. That's the page we're going to bring in. I first thing I do is I import um, pandas, and I'm just setting the uh, options so that I can display stuff easily, and I've written a little function here that basically pulls in uh, the data from that web from a web page. That was the web page you just saw right here, which is a bunch of tables. So I want to bring in a bunch of tables. So I'm going to go ahead and I have a little function that does it, but it's pretty straightforward if you look at it. it just gets data from from the web page, and let's go ahead and pull some data in. All right, so now that I've pulled in this data, and I pulled this in as what I call full data frame. And actually what it is, it's a list of data frames. So if I pull up full data frame, you can see that each, there's a bunch of 33 different data frames. And the reason for that is that there's 33 tables on this web page. It's kind of cool that you can pull these things in just as tables. And if I double click on those, I'm going to actually pull up the actual data frame. So each, this is just a list of data frames. Now, the concept of a data frame object is kind of hard to wrap your head around unless you're doing, so let's say, database programming, because what it does is a data frame needs to be able to encapsulate the data in a table. And um, it's not an array, it's not a tuple, it's not a list, it's its own thing. Now, you can convert it to those different things, but right now, it's its own thing, and its own thing that it is, is based upon the data that you're pulling in. Now you can play a lot with data frames and look at the documentation for data frames, which by the way, I do recommend that you do because if you look at, let's, let's come back over here and to the pandas documentation for data frames, there is a ton of documentation. It has a lot of attributes. It has a ton of methods. And the beauty of this is, is not that it's terribly complex. It's just that it can do a lot of things that you might need to do with data just built right into it. Now, we're not going to go into all that because what I want you to do is understand the basics of this. So, the whole page that I just pulled in is a list, brought in a list of a bunch of data frames, and each data frame I can look at individually in my variable explorer. But we're going to play with those. So, the first thing I want to do is I really just want to pull the data from, I just want to put the data from the first one into this variable first df. So my first DF is the data frame, and this data frame itself is simply going to be the data that was the first element of all those tables that I brought in in that big list. So it's it's in itself is a data frame. Uh, let's look at it for a second. You notice that it has a temperature. It has it has basically a header set here and indexes here. And um, one of the things you got to note about this one is when I pulled that in, and you're trying to work if you're trying to work with numerical values. The first value is not a numerical value. It's sat, period. So you're going to have to deal with that if you're trying to use it as numerical. That's part of the homework that I'm giving to the students is how to deal with that. So let's look a little bit at this. Um, you can see that I brought this in. Basically, at, so remember, it was a list of data frames that I brought in. So to get to the first data frame, which is the first table, DF0 will get me that. I could have just easily put DF1 there and it would, I mean, it's going to be all the different ones. Now, one thing I can do is I can look at those columns. And uh, so I just put that into a variable calls. And let's take a look at that. So if I look at this calls, okay, wow, what is this? Um, I'm going to pull this up a little bit so you can see it. Multi index. And what I have is a tuple of an array of tuples. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's kind of complex there, but let's let's just play with this a little bit so that you can kind of get an idea of the complexity, uh, you know, what this actually is. So um, let's first look at the first call. So because the first calls, which is calls index zero, has temp and deg c, and you notice it doesn't have brackets; it has parentheses. Well. Oh gosh, what do we do with that? I mean, it's not an array. Oh shoot, we can't matter. Well, it doesn't matter because guess what? You can easily reference that. You can easily get to these things just like 
you could with an array or with a, with a list. Calls a zero, zero is temp. So it's right there, that first element there, which is indexed as zero, zero, is the element temp. So what's a tuple? Well, a tuple is essentially, just think of it as a list, but you can't change the values of it. Okay, that's going to be simple enough for what you need to do in this class. Pretty much covers it. So I can get to these different elements of the um, of the first, and this is the first column, but if you look at data frame, okay, that first column has these, okay, notice it actually shows it as parenthesis temp degree C close parenthesis. So it shows it as what it is, which is a tuple with two values in it, the temp and the degree C, which kind of mimic what we had in the table because the table itself, if we go back to that table, you'll see that it actually had two rows of values that made up that, that column index. And the, the, when I read it in, it was smart enough to figure that out. All right, so what are some of the things that we can do with this? Let's play some values here. Let's first look at the iLock. Okay, iLock, what is that? Okay, well, if I do iLock a zero, that creates for me a series, and I'm gonna bring up two of them so you can kind of see how this works. All right, so that first one is a series. Now, if you look at this, the index was the column header and the zeroth element of from that index is the values that were in the table. So in other words, kind of what was that? Well, let's look back over at the data frame itself. That was the first and that was the second that came in from the iLock. So in other words, this was the set of indexes and this was the set of values here. So the indexes and the values. Kind of easier to see if I look at the second one because it's going to start making sense. Oh, look. If I look at the second one, the indexes didn't change. It's that tuple, which was the header, which is now the index, and the values are the values from now the second column, which is, of course, indexed as one. So those values came in. Okay, can we go back over and look at that and see how that, that lurk, looked? Well, all we got to do is simply go back over to the data frame and say, oh, look, the values were taken from here and the headers, whoops, the headers were taken from the headers. All right. Now, I know that I can actually get that. How can I get to individual values? Well, what I can do is I can just simply use the standard indexing technique. So if I set E11, and I called it E11 because it's, uh, I, I see that that is the value of SAT. Go back to the data frame. Okay, there it is, there it is. So index zero, zero of the iLock gets me to that one right there. So zero, 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 zero. And remember, we index starting at zero. Also, because I used iLock, I could have indexed by the title of the header. Well, that would have been a kind of a pain because I would have had to create the tuple with the values. That is the actual index of the column. Zero, it's also zero, by the way. So um, I can do that with a bunch of them. So if I wanted to do the next one over, I can easily do that. Let's set up e E2. 14.67. If we look at that data frame, 14.67 is the value that's right there. Zero, one. Okay, that should make sense. It's first zero throw, first column. Got it. That should make sense to everybody that's been working with this and the concept of zero indexing. Now, can you set that value to something different? Well, let's try this. Okay, I'm thinking, oh, look, I got the iLock. I'll just, I, I know how to get to it. Let's go ahead and see if that'll work. Oh, crash, it doesn't like to do that. Well, I didn't expect it to work. And the reason is kind of simple here. You just, um, it, you kind of have to think about it a little bit, but the reality is, is that when you use the iLock and you use that, let's say that zero, what this is actually doing is making a copy of iLock zero and then throwing over the index, the thing that is, is index one. So setting the value of a copy of something that I, um, well, I can't do that. It's not going to change the original value here. So let's look, let's think about that again. When I do this, okay, it returns that value. Okay, all I'm doing to get to the next level up to the value is simply now looking at the value at the index on that copy. So in other words, there's an order of precedence, just like in ar arithmetic, where that first df.iloc0 returns something 
which then is operated on with that array brackets one, which, which pulls back the value at one of that. Hmm. Well, that's not going to work for me to assign it that way. Ah, but guess what? Good old Pandas, the library I'm using, comes up with something that allows you to do that, the I at. So if I then do, let's say, the I at, I can set it to equal to 15. But now here's something that you should always pay attention to. If I say, okay, remember up here I said E12 to be the value at 0, 1. Okay, now if I print back E12, if I print E12, well, guess what? It's still going to be 14.67. Well, because I never changed that. Going in and changing the value that was actually in the data frame by using the IAT doesn't change the assignments that that was made to. You've got to go back and redo that. So in other words, I'd have to re-execute E12 equals that value. But first, let's look to see if that value still actually, did it actually change. So if I print this out, we'll look at that. It prints out as 15.0. In fact, if I go back and look at the data frame itself, I'm going to find that that value there, which was 14.67, is now 15. So it did get changed. Okay, so what we've covered here. And there is a lot of stuff that we did not cover. But the basic logic of how you pull up a data frame. Now, I can easily convert things in the data frames to other things. Like, in other words, I could convert, let's say, this to a list. It's fairly simple. I could convert any of this to a list. I could just simply say, put that list parenthesis there, because the list function would convert things to a list. That is stuff that you will be doing um, because it's easier sometimes to work with lists or arrays. I kind of use them you know, interchangeably. But um, if you have, let's say, a whole bunch of values. And the pandas um, has, in the data frame, ways of manipulating this very, very easily. And you should at least look over this massive list of the methods that you can do with, and so, I mean, it just keeps going and going, all the methods that are available to you in a data frame. So essentially, if you want to manipulate a data frame, like remove the column headers so that all you have is values, you can do that. If you want to remove um, things that are not values as you're going along, guess what? It's got things to do that. If you've got, if you want to replace anything that is not actually a float or a value, with some with a float or a value, it can do that. All of those things are capable to do right off the bat with the methods that are available to you in the data frame object. So it's kind of got a lot of power to it. And the attributes are also pretty easy to, to do too. So that should get you started on that concept of working with data frames. I know it's a big, scary object with a lot of stuff that it can do, but that's the advantage of it. It's a big object with a lot of stuff that you can do. So you've worked uh, in my class with lists and variables, but don't be afraid of these other objects because they're designed to make your life easier to do once you get used to using them. So the moral of the story is get used to using them. So, um, and, and one thing that you can definitely would want to do is that data frame object will be very, very happy thing for you to be able to use because of what it can do. I can go read data right off the, um, I mean, right off the website. Now, NumPy and data frames put together give you a tremendous amount of capability. One of the things that you can do is that concept of two-dimensional, one-dimensional interpolation, which is pretty awesome because that's built into NumPy. And if you know how to use the data frames and the NumPy together, it makes life really easy. Not a lot of lines of code to make it all work. So hopefully this is useful to you. My Programming for Engineers guys, um, I know this is something you're going to want to know. Good programming.